Are we ready to get going here? All right. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Gail Gunn. She's the Executive Director of Audubon Washington, and she is going to uh, start things off for us. Thank you, Kimberly. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for being on the call today. Uh, this is an important time, and while we're dismayed that it's taking so long to have action on climate in our state, uh, we are encouraged by how far the climate conversation has come in the past few years. Washington is ready for this and wants to act. You'll hear in just a few minutes about how people in Washington feel about climate action. And climate change is real. I'm the bird person and birds have been telling us for a while that it's, it's time to take action. Our research shows that climate change is the number one threat to birds. And as you all know, birds have long been indicators uh, of problems in our environment. Uh, there's a reason canaries were sent into coal mines, you know, 150 years ago. Um, data shows that 40% of bird ranges have shifted north in the past several years as climate change affects their habitats. <clears throat> so right now in our state, there's a lot of great dialogue um, and discussion around policy paths. You heard from the governor on Tuesday uh, about his plans for a price on carbon, and we think that's great. So what you'll hear today is that there are other strong policy proposals on the table that will put our state on a path toward 100% clean electricity, that there's strong public support for these policies, and that we are all working together to achieve a common goal, uh, much needed climate action. The legislature has been talking about climate policy for the last 10 years. We really can't wait any longer. We need our legislators to do what we elect them to do, tackle the toughest issues of our time. I'm now gonna ask Vlad from Climate Solutions to say a few words, and then Dave with FM3 will present our polling data. So take it away, Vlad. Thanks very much, Gail. Uh, and thanks everyone for uh, spending some time with us this morning. Uh, I'm Vlad Gutman Britton. I'm the Washington Director of Climate Solutions. Um, you know, with the climate crisis escalating, we, we firmly think that states must lead the way toward a clean energy transition. Time is of the essence, and our state is one of the best positioned to demonstrate that the transition to a fossil fuel-free electric power system and cleaner transportation fuels is, is technically, uh, technically possible, economically viable, and a key driver for new jobs and economic growth now and in the future. We worry about the very real human impacts of climate change. When it comes to economic costs, Washington's Department of Ecology estimates the average household will pay nearly $4,000 per year in climate-related damages to our economy, and that's due to impacts like increased energy costs, wildfires, uh, reduced food production, coastal and storm damage, public health impacts, and the like. On the other hand, we know that clean energy provides significant economic benefits. Renewable power creates more jobs per unit of energy produced than fossil fuels and offers long-term cost stability. It costs two-thirds less to drive an electric vehicle than a gasoline-powered one, and the significant air quality improvements of a clean transition will improve public health and life expectancy. We think there are a range of policies the state can and should adopt to secure these benefits for us, and we learned in our research that the pub public is ready to support them. Audubon and Climate Solutions work with Dave Metz of FM3 Le Research to learn about how the public thinks about these policies, and we wanted to uh, share those with you now. I think we're going to take just a second here to kind of uh, switch screen shares for a moment. So we turned off ours, and Dave, if you uh, want to share yours and kind of launch in, we can uh, get going. Uh, okay, just a second. Uh, so the presentation isn't already loaded. Uh, uh, to all right. time, I can go ahead. Hey, Dave, I have it loaded up on mine, so we'll just go okay, ahead and run it here. Tell me, to, tell me to advance the slides. Okay, I think I got it. Give me just a second here. All right, Kimberly, if it isn't visible, why don't you go ahead and run it on your end? I've quick chat. No, it's visible. Let's just go ahead and uh, run the slideshow now oh. if you okay. visible. All right. All, set. Great. All right, thanks for the pause. Okay. All right, so um, we're going to walk through the results of our uh, survey, um, which was conducted at the beginning of December. We talked to just over 600 voters statewide who, based on their past voting history, are considered likely to cast ballots in the November election. Um, of this year. Um, overall, we have uh, two different samples that we're going to be looking at here. We had a sample of 400 that we asked about a 100% clean energy standard, and we had a sample 
of 200 voters that we asked about a clean fuel standard. Um, you'll see the margins of error for each of those samples, 4.9% and 6.9% respectively. And there's also a couple of places where we'll make reference to an additional survey that we conducted, an online survey of likely voters at the beginning of October that explored some more general perceptions around climate and uh, the desire for uh, action on some of the issues that, that Gail and Vlad have described. So to start, just a little bit about some of those big picture issues and a little bit about the political context in which this is all happening in Washington state. Uh, at the beginning of the survey, we asked our respondents to tell us whether they thought that things in Washington were generally headed in the right direction or off on the wrong track, which is a useful barometer about the overall public mood. And as you'll see, going back a decade, uh, Washington has been pretty closely divided on this question. But relative to what we've seen in some recent surveys, the numbers have been moving in a more positive direction, with a 48% plurality now saying that they think things in the state are headed in the right direction. We also asked our respondents to tell us their feelings about a variety of different uh, actors in the political and public policy spheres in Washington. And uh, you'll see those uh, uh, um, numbers reflected here. Um, when we asked about Governor Inslee, 52% tell us they have a favorable opinion compared to just 33% unfavorable for a 19 point net uh, positive on his favorability. And the legislature itself um, is also viewed highly favorably. 46% positive to 37% unfavorable. Um, not every legislature is in that position. There's a lot of states where we're doing this kind of polling where we see much more negative attitudes toward legislative bodies. Um, attitudes toward the president are overwhelmingly negative in Washington state. Um, his numbers across the country are not very good, but they are even worse here. Only 34% have a favorable view of him, 62% unfavorable, and note that a majority of likely voters in Washington view the president very unfavorably at 53%. Electric utilities are also viewed favorably, 67% uh, to 16. Now looking ahead to the election this fall, um, one of the things that we're tracking closely in a lot of our polling is the degree of interest, engagement, and enthusiasm that voters are expressing. Uh, for participating in that election. And so we asked people to tell us on a 10 point scale how interested they are in November's election. 66% of Washington voters, almost two thirds, rated their level of interest a 10. That is extraordinarily high compared to what we have seen in past elections and reflects what we've seen across the country, which is a lot of engagement in what's gonna happen this November. Also worth noting that those who are most engaged and have the highest level of interest tend to come from the progressive side of the electorate. Uh, Democrats, liberals, uh, residents of the city of Seattle, union members are among those who say they are most interested in the election. Um, those are all also groups that show a broad support for taking action on climate and clean energy. And it fuels a lot of the positive numbers that I think we're gonna see in just a few minutes. Uh, finally, we also had a couple of questions that we asked about attitudes toward the issue of climate change specifically. These come from that October online survey that we conducted. In Washington state, more than four in five voters tell us they believe that climate change is happening, including more than two in five who tell us they are extremely sure that it's taking place. And a critical follow-up question, uh, there is a clear majority of Washingtonians, 55%, who believe that climate change is caused mostly by human activities, only around one third who attribute it largely to natural changes in the environment. So all of that, I think, uh, provides some important data that shows why there's a favorable political context this year for action on uh, climate issues in Washington state. I'll hand it back to Vlad to talk about some of the uh, specific policies that we took a look at. Vlad, you may be muted. Okay. Uh, uh, can you guys hear me now? My apologies. Yes, no problem. Thank you. Can you jump one slide ahead, Dave? Yes. So uh, th thanks, thanks for that introduction, Dave. So uh, the first policy we're going to talk about is a 100% clean electricity uh, uh, policy that we tested. Um, importantly, uh, electricity is the third highest source of emissions in Washington, and the policy we're uh, examining here would uh, lead to a transition to 100% carbon-free power by 2045, 
uh, over the course of the next three decades. It would also accelerate coal closure, ensuring that coal isn't used to by while ensuring that coal isn't used to serve Washington electricity by about 2030. And the result of this all is that if there is a future carbon price, it would also uh, reduce uh, the public's exposure to that uh, to that impact. Uh, our estimates are that uh, this policy, if, if, uh, if passed, would reduce electric sector emissions by a little over 60% compared to 2013 levels uh, by 2030, and that's about 11.5 million tons, and get us to, as I said, completely clean by mid-century uh, in the electricity sector, about an 18 million ton reduction. Uh, we'll, we'll, at the end, we'll kind of, I'm happy to answer questions about the policy specifically, but uh, we wanted to provide that kind of initial summary on uh, how it works before we launch into uh, the data we, heard, we learned about it. Go ahead, Dave. All right. So the context in which we tested this idea in the survey was to present people with language for a hypothetical ballot initiative. Uh, you'll see the language we tested here. Pretty simple and straightforward. Um, phasing out coal-generated electricity by 2030. Um, moving to 100% use of renewable resources by 2045. And we asked people how they would vote were an initiative like that on the ballot. And as you'll see here, 66% indicated they would vote yes, 27% indicated they would vote no. So that's 16 points over the majority that would be required for approval, uh, a two to one ratio of, of support to opposition, more than two to one. And critically, um, if you look at the numbers at the, the top and bottom of the graph here, those who said they would definitely be supportive or those who are definitely opposed, three times as many voters say they definitely favor the idea as oppose it. Almost half of all Washington voters tell us that they are strongly uh, supportive of this policy. Um, so obviously, these are very strong numbers when you think about a, a public vote. Um, but what we also find is that the the level of support we see for initiative concepts like this very closely corresponds with support for the underlying policy. And I think when we think about this in a legislative context, um, these numbers translate uh, pretty much directly into support for uh, legislation on the same topic. There was also a lot of geographic uh, consistency in support for the uh, proposal. Um, the core support, not surprisingly, comes from the city of Seattle, 94% uh, of Seattle residents telling us they would be supportive. Um, in eastern King County, the numbers are 67%. And then for looking at the rest of the state, we basically divided it by utility providers. Um, we've got uh, the utilities running down the left-hand side of the slide. At the bottom, at the top, we've got people who are in the balance of the state of Washington, not in one of those other service territories. And you'll see that across the, the state, we've basically got 66% overall that are telling us they are supportive of, uh, of this idea. So a lot of um, uh, sort of uh, consistency across different regions of the state. We also wanted to understand the degree to which support for this idea would hold up in the face of things that supporters and opponents would likely say. And so we offered the respondents a set of seven arguments in favor of the policy, seven arguments against it. We rotated the order in which those statements were presented, half for the arguments in favor first, half for the arguments against, so that we were basically very even-handed in the amount of information we're presenting on both sides. And as you'll see here, the level of support was very consistent before and after exposure to that messaging. We started with 66% support, and after the pros and cons, it was functionally unchanged at 62%. And even when we divide our sample into the half that heard just the, the positive arguments first or just the negative arguments first, even in those circumstances, the numbers didn't move very much. Um, after hearing nothing but a string of seven opposition arguments, support only dropped to 56%, still a solid majority, and still with 40% in favor. So support is not just broad, but it's very durable and very robust as well. Um, what we also found was that respondents were very supportive of the idea of a legislator taking action on this issue. Um, we asked respondents if their state legislator voted for uh, the equivalent of this measure in the next legislative session, what impact that would have on their support for that legislator. And as you'll see on the left-hand side, more than twice as many voters say that would make them more likely to vote for their legislator as opposed to less likely, with about one third saying it would make no difference. So it's an overwhelmingly net positive impact on legislators who uh, would be supportive of this policy. 
And when we narrow our analysis to focus only on a, a subset of battleground legislative districts in Washington state, the ones that are likely to be most closely contested this November, the results are essentially the same. 39% more likely to vote for a legislator who supports this policy, just 23% less likely to do so. So with that, I'll hand it uh, back to Vlad to talk a little bit about, about the clean fuel standard. Thanks, Dave, and, can, and um I appreciate that. So um, clean fuel standard is a policy, as you can see from the sort of the graphic here on the right, that uh, this Washington is kind of the, uh, the, the, last, uh, the last man standing to not have on the West Coast. So California, Oregon, and British Columbia have adopted versions of a clean fuels program. Uh, it, requires, it would require uh, refineries to achieve a reduction in the pollution from each individual gallon of gasoline or diesel they sell by about by 10%. Um, over the course of about a decade. Refineries can comply with this requirement by blending biofuels, by purchasing, by, by providing support for electric vehicles and other, uh, other kind of clean transportation, reducing emissions at their own smokestack, which provides air quality improvements for communities that live around them and through other means. Uh, a 10% reduction would cut about 3 million tons of carbon dioxide uh, from Washington, uh, associated with Washington transportation. Uh, so it's a substantial, it's a substantial reduction in a key in a key uh, emissions area that we need to uh, really focus on and uh, make investments in. And uh, uh, versions of this pro program exist in addition to the states that I mentioned uh, across the world in the United Kingdom and the European Union. Go ahead, Dave. Thanks. All right. So in the context of the poll, again, we tested this initially in the form of a potential ballot measure. And we offered the respondents the language that you'll see listed here. Um, initiative concerns establishment of a clean fuel standard requiring oil refineries and distributors to reduce the carbon pollution in those fuels by 10% by 2025. Um, and then adjusting state law to protect funding for public transit and trails uh, in, in tandem with the approval of that clean fuel standard. This idea also gets a broad initial support. Almost two thirds of Washington voters tell us they would favor it. 65% say they would vote yes, 28% say no. Um, and again, we've got more than twice as many who say they would definitely favor the idea as say they would definitely oppose it. We did the same uh, essential approach with this measure that we did with the 100% clean energy standard, uh, testing a range of pro and con messages, six in favor and five opposed, rotating the order in which they were presented. And similarly, we see that support for the clean fuel standard is very durable in the face of that messaging. 65% indicate that they would vote yes uh, initially, and then after hearing messaging on both sides, 61% say they would vote yes, with roughly the same proportions definitely in favor and definitely opposed as when we started. And again, even when we face the toughest possible test, looking at that portion of our sample that heard the negative arguments first, in isolation, before they heard the arguments in favor, even after exposure to only those negative arguments, a majority was still supportive, 55% in favor and 41% opposed. Um, we also asked the same question about how uh, voters would respond to a legislator who in, voted to enact this measure over the course of the legislative session. And once again, we see that it is a clear political net positive for those legislators. By a two to one margin, 45 to 19, voters say they are more likely as opposed to less likely to vote for a legislator who uh, supports this policy. And in battleground districts, again, uh, support is equally robust, 49% more likely, 13% less likely. Uh, with the remainder saying that they um, had no uh, no strong feelings uh, either way in terms of its impact on them. Um, and here uh, you'll see some notes on uh, uh, party divisions on these uh, issues as well. A um, little bit more positive with uh, with Democrats, but then with independents, um, still a net positive on this policy. So that takes us to our uh, summary conclusions. I'll just uh, sort of overview the highlights here and, and then hand it back to Gail for some final comments. Um, essentially, when we look at the summary of where these measures start and finish as listed here, um, you'll see that we're in very, very strong shape, both uh, with the initial level of support and with the final level of support. 
and also with the intensity of support. Um, the, it is not only a broad group of Washingtonians that think these are good ideas, but it is a group that feels strongly about them and, uh, and has some energy behind that support that it's offering, which is what helps make it so durable in the face of hearing the political back and forth that uh, could go on um, as these measures are debated in the, the legislature or ultimately come forward to a ballot. Um, I should also note that you know what we have seen in a range of polling is that because voters' desire for action on clean energy and climate is so broad, um, that they are open to approaches that involve multiple legislative actions that could be taken to achieve these goals. They don't believe there is only one path we can go down, and they tend to see these policies as being complementary to one another and other actions uh, that might be taken to try to move Washington toward more use of clean energy and uh, reduce the amount of carbon pollution that the state is emitting. So all of this data, I think, adds up to showing that there is a real powerful opportunity here uh, for climate action, which uh, Washington probably, uh, there's probably a better climate than this state has seen before um, for real uh, strong forward movement on these issues. So with that, I will hand it back to Gail for some closing comments. Great, thank you, Dave, so much for that, and Vlad also. Um, so in closing, I just want to reiterate how critical we feel it is for the legislature to do something now. You know, they've got roughly, what, 54 days, you know, left in this 60-day session. Um, and it's really important that, um, that they do something. Uh, the people of Washington, you saw clearly from these slides, want action on climate. And, and our future generations, quite frankly, deserve, you know, for us to be bold and take this action. Um, I know that you really want to get to the, the questions here, so I'm going to, Kimberly's going to um, handle and moderate that for us, and so I'm going to hand it back to her. Great, thank you so much. Uh, now we wanted to do, I think I mentioned, um, and I'm going to uh, just move ahead to um, uh, unmute folks. People can uh, go ahead and unmute themselves if they need. Um, and. Otherwise, I can, and I want to emphasize again that people can also chat into the screen or into the uh, webinar if you so need. Um, so if anybody, if you're having issues, feel free to text me at 206-388-8674 um, because then I can help get you unmuted if needed. So I'd like to move to questions. And if there are none, we can then give people their morning back. <laughs> Yeah, good morning. This is uh, Paul Shikoski with the Bloomberg. How are you? Um, Thank you for joining us, Paul. Sure. Um, so this begs the question, if the legislature doesn't act, what, are, what do you uh, folks plan to do from Climate Solutions in Audubon? I, I think it's a little too early to talk about specific next steps. Audubon and Climate Solutions strongly prefer a policy to be passed in the legislature, and we're committed to doing everything we can to get it done in Olympia. We clearly have policy that holds very well with the public and we're encouraged by the high level of interest in getting something past this session. And we do think it's important to have a climate win in 2018 and set the stage for future climate policies in the years ahead that lead to a carbon-free transition for Washington State. Well, do you, do you plan on, let me just ask you outright, do you have plans to introduce an initiative? Currently, you've, you've been testing it, so this is obviously something that you've been talking about. Where, where does that stand? Uh, all, both of our organizations are, are, are part of a broader, our broader movement to act on climate, and we're all very committed to a, a single unified approach at the ballot this year, working, working in support of the, of the Alliance's work. Our climate Solutions is a member of the Alliance to support uh, moving forward with action to the ballot. These specific policies, yeah, if the legislature doesn't take them up, uh, we, we will, uh, over the coming years, and this year in particular, then we will want to explore going to the people on them. Okay, thanks. Are there other questions for our presenters? Again, you can either chat in or unmute yourself um, on the uh, webinar. All right, well, if there are no other <clears throat> questions, um, I'd like to then uh, make, let you know that these results will be uh, released at 10 a.m. Uh, they're embargoed until then, and we're going to be sending out a news release that you all will also receive in your inboxes 
there, if you have any further questions, you can contact myself or Samara, who's listed here and also on the news release as far as our phone numbers and emails. We'd love to uh, make available you know, the polling results, as well as Gail and Vlad and Dave are available today for other further questions as you put together stories and continue to cover these issues in the legislature this session. All right, thank you very much for your time. We hope you have an uh, excellent day. <clears throat> Thanks, Thanks very much. Bye.